Hello and welcome again to my Physics Online Video Lecture Supplement Series. Today's video is a continuation of lecture set number six, which was on uniform circular motion. This is going to be the second part of that lecture set, which is going to be covering forces and rotational motion. So uh, recall that accelerations are caused by force. This is just Newton's second law as formulated uh, for a any object uh, upon which a net force has been applied. Um, basically what this means is that if there is a centripetal acceleration for an object which is moving in a circle, for example, then you're going to need to have some sort of centripetal force to um, supply that acceleration. And this centripetal force is not a new force which comes into being because a fictitious force is needed to put an object on a circle. Rather, it is some already existing force which is applied to the object which um, basically supplies that centripetal acceleration. Oftentimes that force might be gravity or it could be a normal force or it could be the force of tension in the case of, for example, a, a tether ball. Um, so you have to have an actually already pre-existing force in order to get centripetal motion, in other words. The second uh, topic of actual interest in this is that Newton's law of general gravitation was actually formulated because there needed to be some centripetal force to explain the orbit of the moon and of uh, all of the planets around the sun and so on. And although we're not necessarily going to talk about this in today's lecture set, it's worth adding that Kepler's laws actually improve upon the notion that planetary orbits are circular. The uh, model of the solar system, which was formulated by uh, Copernicus and championed by Galileo, actually had all the planets moving in circular orbits around the sun. Kepler improved this model by uh, predicting elliptical orbits, but that will be a topic for the next lecture set. So let's talk about centripetal force. Uh, this is the efficient cause, as it were, of a centripetal acceleration. So using Newton's laws, you can see that um, in general F equals ma, and what's usually meant by that is that the net force is applied to an object is the object's mass times the object's acceleration, uh, assuming of course that the object is uh, of constant mass. Now Newton's first law basically says that if there's no net force then there's no acceleration. Newton's second law gives us that F equals ma and as applied to the specific case where you have an object which is moving in a circular orbit then it means that the total centripetal force must equal the object's mass times the, the centripetal acceleration. And so that means that it's going to be equal to the object's mass times the speed squared that the object is moving at divided by the radius of the circle upon which the object is orbiting. The direction of this force has to be in the same direction as the centripetal acceleration, which means that it points to the center of the circle um, and therefore is actually perpendicular to the tangential velocity. So in fact here is a diagram that is showing these uh, for both a large and a small circle. The larger the circle is, the smaller the force is needed to keep the same object um, on that circle uh, at the same speed and vice versa. So notice that the speed um, is itself constant, the velocity is changing because it's a vector quantity, and notice that the force is perpendicular to the velocity vector, and this is because the centripetal acceleration must be perpendicular to the, centrip to the um, tangential velocity. So centripetal motion therefore requires some sort of a centripetal force. That means that the centripetal force has to increase if the speed increases, and it can decrease if the radius increases. 
according to the equation on the previous slide. Um, if, if these conditions are not met, then the motion will cease to be circular. So in other words, if the uh, force is less than the amount specified here to be circular, in other words, less than the product of the mass and the speed squared divided by the radius, then the object will sort of uh, leave the circle onto a larger orbit. And if it is greater, then it may leave the circle onto a smaller or tighter orbit. Again, this centripetal force has to be supplied by some already existing external force. So in the case of planets in orbit, it is supplied by gravity. In the case of maybe you have like a ball at the end of a string, like a tether ball, um, but without wrapping around the pole, then this force is due to tension in a string. If you have a roller coaster, it may be a combination of gravity and the normal force between the coaster and the tracks. Uh, in the case of a car going around a corner, it's caused by friction, etc. So in all these cases, there's not a new force called the, the centripetal force, which has to be generated. Instead, some force that is already present acts to keep the object on a circular motion. So let's look at a conceptual example of this by considering a roller coaster. So this right here is a roller coaster which is at the bottom of its motion. So at the bottom of the motion on a roller coaster, there is gravity pulling downward upon the roller coaster. That is this purple uh, arrow. There is also a necessary centripetal force on the roller coaster because it has in fact gone through a circular loop. So the red arrow is representing the centripetal force. So what is there to uh, provide this centripetal force? Well, the normal force has to provide the centripetal acceleration. And so in this case, rather than having a normal force which is merely equal to gravity, you have a normal force which is equal to gravity, uh, excuse me, it's a equal in magnitude to the magnitude of the normal force plus the magnitude of gravity. It is in fact um, given that the centripetal force is the vector sum of the normal force and of gravity. So at the bottom of the loop there is a very large normal force to uh, push upwards on the roller coaster towards the center of the circle. To extend this example let's consider a roller coaster at the top of a loop. At the very top of the loop you still have to have a centripetal force which is pointing downward towards the middle of the circle. And so in order to get that force downward to the middle you have some force of gravity and you have some normal force and again the two forces add together to give you the uh, net force uh, for centripetal acceleration. So the vector sum of normal force plus gravity gives you the uh, centripetal acceleration. What this implies incidentally in this case is that if the speed is not great enough such that the centripetal force is greater than the force of gravity, in other words if you don't need any normal force pointing downwards, if you need a non-zero normal force, excuse me, if you need zero normal force, then the roller coaster falls off the track. So the speed has to be great enough that the centripetal force needed is at least as great as gravity and typically slightly greater than gravity so that there is a non-zero normal force in order to keep the, the uh, coaster on the track. There's another application of this centripetal force and that is found in taking corners on a road. So if you consider a car that's trying to handle a, a corner on a bit of flat level roadway, what you find is that the force diagram for that car looks something like this. You have a normal force pointing upward. You have a force of gravity pointing downward. Those two should be equal and opposite and therefore would cancel when applying Newton's second law. And there is a frictional force pointing towards the center of the a circle that this curve would lie along. Uh, 
So that is what's pr supplying you your centripetal force and therefore your centripetal acceleration. Specifically, because the car is moving uh, without slipping, this force of friction is actually equal to the static friction and not the kinetic friction, typically. If the car is skidding, then you have kinetic friction, but, but usually this is going to be static friction, and so there must be some component to static friction which points towards the center of the road, uh, towards the center of the circle along which the road lies, that is. And so if the centripetal force is equal to the force of friction, then what that implies is that you can find the maximum speed at which a car can handle a given corner safely. So basically the way that works is that the force of friction is given by the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. So on a flat level road that looks like mu sub s times mg and this is to get the maximum amount of static friction. The centripetal force meanwhile is the mass of the car times the car's speed squared divided by the radius of curvature. So if you put those two things together basically set force of centripetal uh, force equal to the force of friction what you end up getting is mv squared over r is equal to mu mg. So the two masses cancel out and solving for v you end up getting that the speed is the square root of the static um, coefficient of static friction times the free fall acceleration times the radius of curvature. So that means that on a wet day you should expect to have a lower speed at which you can handle a corner than on a dry day because the coefficient of static friction is lower for wet concrete than for dry concrete uh, versus tires. And similarly the larger that is the curve the greater the speed that you can take to handle that curve. Or in other words the tighter the curve the lower the speed you can still handle the curve on. Now most curves end up not just being flat. In fact, oftentimes we make what are called banked curves. And what a banked curve is, is that the road is uh, on sort of an incline. So the center of the circle is in, from, uh, from this car's perspective, is to the left. And the road is banked so that the car is running along what might look like the cross section of a uh, the inside of a bowl. So um, what that basically means is that there are some additional forces at play here. Specifically, while the car has some weight, there is also now a normal force which is not anti-parallel to gravity. And so the normal force has a component which is uh, basically perpendicular to gravity and one component which is parallel to the gravity. The component that's parallel to gravity may basically just uh, cancel with gravity. The part that's perpendicular towards it is actually pointing now towards the center of the circle and if you have a frictionless banked curve what that means is that this is now your centripetal force and so to get this component of the normal force you basically can use that this component is parallel to gravity. Your triangle basically has this is one side, this is one side, and a side whose length is equal to, on this scale, the normal force, would be the hypotenuse. So the tangent of this angle theta is always opposite over adjacent. That would be the uh, centripetal portion of the normal force divided by the um, basically non-centripetal portion of the normal force, the vertical portion if you will. And that vertical portion is basically going to be equal more or less to the um, weight of the car. And so therefore the tangent of angle theta is equal to v squared over r g means that the more the greater this 
angle, the greater the speed is that you can attempt this curve at, even if the road is frictionless. If you add friction to this, then friction actually has a component that's presumably going to be along the road one way or the other. Um, so either this way or this way along the ramp. And that too can be broken up into one component that is vertical and one that's horizontal. So this actually is a case where it may be more useful to break up your vectors so that this is x and this is y. Horizontal is x, vertical is y, rather than along the ramp is x, out of the ramp is y. Because the direction that you're most interested in is the horizontal direction, which gives you the centripetal direction. In any case, with no friction, tangent of theta is equal to v squared over rg. Basically just means take the tangent of this angle. That's equal to the speed of the car uh, divided by, uh, speed squared of the car, excuse me, divided by the radius of curvature for this road um, times the free fall acceleration. So moving on from our cars attempting to handle curves. The other interesting thing that comes out of circular motion is gravity, Newton's law of universal gravitation. And Newton's law of universal gravitation basically states that every particle in the universe experiences an attraction to every other particle in the universe, provided the two particles have mass and that the attraction is proportional to the product of the two particles masses. It's also got to be inversely proportional to the distance between the two particles. So if you have particle one and particle two, the attraction means that the force is pointing from particle one to particle two, and that's the force that's on particle one. The force on particle two is pointing towards particle one. So this is the attractive part of the force. The distance between them we represent with r, the masses we represent with m1 and m2, and the end result is that you get that the force of gravity uh, magnitude is g m1 m2 over r squared. If you wanted to treat this as a vector, the direction is always inward, so oftentimes this equation is written with a minus sign in front of everything. Um, that's just to remind us that the two particles are pulled towards each other and not um, repelled from each other. But if you just want the magnitude, negative signs don't really matter, and so you just have g m1 m2 over r squared. So that begs the question, what is capital G represent? Lowercase g, we've been using to represent the free fall, or sometimes called gravitational acceleration near the surface of the Earth. What does big G represent, though? And the answer is that big G represents what's called the universal gravitational constant. So gravity itself is always an attractive force, and that means that it's always going to point towards the center of the pair of particles that are exerting gravitational force on each other. Um, in fact, it generally points to what's called the center of mass of the two particles. In any case, the uh, having the masses and having the distance between them gets you most of the force. What you have left is this universal gravitational constant, and that's just a fundamental constant of the universe. It's, it's the same value everywhere, um, at least in classical physics, and it has an approximate value of 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. And if you look at these units, Newton meters squared per kilogram squared, we can look up here. This mass is in kilograms, this mass is in kilograms, so you have kilograms times kilograms, which is kilograms squared, so that cancels with the per kilogram squared here. This radius is in meters, so you have per meter squared, so that's going to cancel with the meters squared here. You're left with newtons, which is the correct unit for force. So let's think of a few more things that have to do with gravity. Um, there is a law that we will actually learn in the second semester of physics, which is called Gauss's law. And this law usually gets applied 
to uh, charges uh, and basically what's called an electric field but it turns out that it works out just fine for being applied to masses and the gravitational field and to make a long story short if you have a spherical object like say the earth or a sun or the moon or any of the planets then as long as you have an object as long as you have a uh, mass that's being attracted to that object from outside the object that object actually can be treated like a point source and you'll get the force right uh, just treat it as a point source located at the object's center or center of gravity as the case may be um, so a planet like the earth can be treated for a person standing on the surface as if all the mass is concentrated at the very center of the earth so now you just need to know what the radius of the earth is and the total mass of the earth and you can find out how much gravitational force there is as a sort of conceptual example of uh, newton's law of universal gravitation we could ask when does weight actually equal mass times free fall acceleration that is when does weight equal 9.8 meters per second squared times the mass of the object and the answer is that to a reasonably good approximation uh, if you want to just do say two significant figures anywhere where you're standing on the ground on the earth this um, equation is valid so whether you're at New York or San Francisco where the elevation is zero, whether you're in Australia, the equator, the North Pole, all those have elevations of zero. Uh, you'll notice that the gravitational acceleration changed a little bit and that's simply because the Earth is somewhat elongated. It is actually um, a bit wider at the equator than it is from pole to pole. Um, as it turns out, this is just enough to have a noticeable effect if you were to really very carefully in vacuum measure the free fall acceleration of an object. It's not really enough to notice it otherwise. Um, similarly, there are mountains upon the Earth, and those mountains have different elevations above sea level. and that elevation also has some effect on the free fall acceleration. With that said, if you go to two significant figures, every one of these numbers rounds to 9.8 meters per second squared. So as long as you're standing on the ground somewhere on Earth, your free fall acceleration is 9.8. Um, by standing on the ground, I mean maybe you've jumped off of the ground, or maybe you drop an object off the top of a building, that kind of thing. Um, however, if you go up into the atmosphere, and in fact beyond the atmosphere out towards the orbit of the moon, as long as you don't go to the moon itself, you will in fact start to notice that the um, free fall acceleration begins to get smaller and that therefore your weight begins to be less. And we, it is possible to basically do some calculations to figure out just how high above the earth you can be before there's a really noticeable effect. You can go many, many, many kilometers above the earth's surface and still effectively have a weight that is equal to m times g, where g is 9.8 meters per second squared. In fact, a great many of these are 9.80 meters per second squared even if you've rounded out to two significant figures. It kind of depends upon uh, whether you're closer to the poles or closer to the equator more than it does whether you are on a mountain like in Denver, the Mile City, or whether you're more at sea level like in San Francisco or New York. So how do we know the value of the gravitational uh, constant? Well, there's actually been several ways of measuring this. The first actual measurement that, that we know of was by Henry Cavendish at the end of the 18th century. He basically 
made use of a torsion balance, which is something like this minus maybe the mirror and light source. Uh, basically what happens is you have two balls which are of large mass and which are fixed, and then you suspend a rod with two smaller but still massive balls from, say, the ceiling, and you offset them so that they are uh, along this basically dashed line. Then you release them, there is enough gravitation between the uh, balls here and these balls here to cause the whole setup to rotate somewhat. And so you can measure what the acceleration of that rotation is, and if you take into account things like friction and how much uh, torsion there is in the actual rod or string that you're suspending this from, then you are able to measure what the force of gravity between the balls is, and you have masses for all the balls, so therefore you can get the value of g. Um, the mirror actually makes this experiment a little bit easier because you can reflect light off of it onto a far wall and as these things rotate very slowly the, the beam of light will in fact move along the wall um, a little more dramatically and therefore gives you something that's a little easier to measure. Um, there are other ways to uh, get the gravitational constant. For example, you could get the mass and radius of a large object. Uh, the Greeks, for example, got the radius of the Earth using geometry. They figured out the mass using the density, trying to figure out what the rough makeup of the Earth is. And um, so that's one way of trying to measure it. Uh, you could also use asteroids. Usually the makeup's a little more uniform, but their size is a little smaller. In the end, we have NASA. Thank God for them. They used a pair of satellites in what was called the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, which was launched in 2002. They had very, very sensitive instruments. The masses were known very um, precisely for the two and the distance could be easily measured using, for example, a uh, time-of-flight uh, laser signal. And so by measuring what the gravitational acceleration of one or both of these satellites are, they could get the gravitational constant. Um, one last little application of this um, uh, circular motion is has to do with sort of science fiction but could be science reality at some point in the future which is what if we wanted to build a large space station that was habitable by people um, we haven't really done that to much of an extent uh, attempted anything like that you know there have been s space stations like Skylab and the International Space Station but none of them have really been on the scale needed for um, sort of long-term human habitation, settlement, that kind of thing. I suppose if you've watched the movie um, Interstellar, the, the one that was directed by uh, Christopher Nolan and so on, uh, towards the end of that movie there's a space station that is uh, sort of inhabited by the people from Earth, and you actually see a baseball game being played and they hit the baseball and it flies up towards the ceiling of the station and smashes through somebody's house window. The implication essentially was that they had constructed one of these O'Neill cylinders, although it turns out that the scale of the original O'Neill cylinder is large enough such that the scenario of hitting a baseball from the ground to the ceiling is a little bit ridiculous. Let's look at a few examples, and I'll close actually with an example of the O'Neill cylinder, but before we get to that, let's do a couple simpler examples. So for the first example, we have a 35 kilogram rider on this little merry-go-round, and this rider stands 2.5 meters from the center. So the center is right here, maybe the rider is out here on or towards the edge of the merry-go-round, Maybe that's about 2.5 meters. Uh, 
He has a tangential speed of 1.25 meters per second, and so what we want to know is how much force is needed to keep him on the ride. We're not interested here in figuring out whether the force is from friction or from his hanging onto the bars or what. We just want to know what the value of the force is. All right, so if I were to draw this out, um, basically we have our merry-go-round. The rider is out here. He has a given speed V is equal to 1.25 meters per second. Therefore, he needs to have an acceleration, which is towards the center. The center uh, is basically 2.5 meters away. So the centripetal acceleration must be along this direction. And A centripetal is V squared over R. Now what we wanted was not the centripetal acceleration, but rather the centripetal force. So the centripetal force must be the mass times the centripetal acceleration. So that's the mass times the speed squared divided by this distance, R. And so if we want to solve for the centripetal force, what we have is his 35 kilogram mass. Um, and we multiply that by the 1.25 meters per second squared. We divide the whole thing by the 2.5 meter uh, radius from his position to the uh, center of the merry-go-round. And what we end up getting for that is about 21.875. So if we round that off to three significant figures, that would be 21 point nine newtons. So you need 21.9 newtons approximately to keep this kid on the circle of of radius 2.5 meters at 1.25 meters per second squared. And in fact I think in the original problem and I've kind of written it down here 2.5 meters uh, this maybe also is only two significant figures so this in fact we might be able to write 22 newtons if we're keeping track of significant figures. Okay, our next short example is uh, to ask, what is the maximum speed that a car can successfully handle a corner if the radius of curvature is 400 meters and the car's tires have a coefficient of static friction of 0.4 with the road? Uh, before I work this problem, by the way, this right here is a snapshot from I guess the Daytona 500. Uh, this one you can actually see that there's a bank on this curve. So it's curving around and you can see that these cars appear to be higher up than these cars. That's not an illusion. It is in fact a sort of ramp in this direction towards the center. Uh, so with that said let's go ahead and work the example. So here actually is the basic setup of this problem. The road itself may not be an entirely a circle, but it forms part of a circle. So maybe the road now continues straight here, and maybe it continued straight here before going into this curve. Um, but we're going to treat the curve as if it lies on a circle, and the radius of that circle is 400 meters. So the centripetal acceleration uh, is caused by the centripetal force, which in this case is provided entirely by specifically static friction. Now the static friction is always uh, such that it is less than or equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. So in this case that would be the coefficient of static friction times basically the uh, mass of the car times gravitational acceleration. And as for the centripetal force, well that has to be mass times centripetal acceleration, which is mass times V squared over R. So therefore, if we're going to set these two things equal to each other, we have um, that the coefficient of static friction times the mass times the freefall acceleration is equal to the mass times the maximum speed squared divided by radius. Notice that the equality implies maximum speed. If we wanted 
to have some other speed and ask is this safe or not, then the condition would actually be that this is greater than or equal to. But because we're looking for the maximum speed, we have an equality here. So we're solving for the maximum speed. So V max squared must be equal to, uh, we can see that the masses cancel. And so we have R times mu times G. And so therefore the maximum speed must be equal to the square root of R times mu times G. And what we had as values here were 400 meters times the coefficient of static friction, which is 0 0.40 times the free fall acceleration, 9.80 meters per second squared. All right, so that gives us a total value of uh, 39.59, but since we have two significant, to, uh, two significant figures to work with, the maximum speed is about 40 meters per second. So if we round that off, we have 40 meters per second. So that's uh, reasonably fast. That is, in fact, uh, very nearly 88 miles per hour. I would like to consider one last example, this one taken from science fiction, and that is the O'Neill cylinder. And so the original O'Neill cylinder concept would be five, kilom uh, five miles in diameter. So that basically means five miles across, or five miles from here up to here. And it would be 20 miles long, so that's basically from here to here, or from this end all the way down to this end of the cylinder. And basically these two cylinders counterspin. So if this one's clockwise, this one will be counterclockwise or vice versa. And that's basically to uh, negate any kind of uh, gyroscopic effects from conservation of angular momentum, which is another topic that we'll discuss later anyway. Um, so, the example itself basically says, what is the rotational speed that we would need for this uh, cylinder in order to basically simulate the gravity from Earth? In other words, we need to have a normal force between the wall and the person that is equal to the gravitational force in magnitude of the Earth. So your O'Neill cylinder basically has a cross section that is circular like this. You have a person who is standing in the cylinder. They're standing tall here. There is a centripetal force. This right here had a diameter of five miles or eight kilometers. So the radius is 4.0 kilometers or r equals 4,000 meters and what we want to know is we want the centripetal force which is actually equal to the normal force in this case to be equal to the guy's mass times the free fall acceleration. Now the centripetal force must be the guy's mass times his centripetal acceleration so that means it's the mass times the speed squared over R. We're solving for this term right here, the speed. So we set this and this equal, and that means that this and this are equal. So you have mg is equal to mv squared over r. So if you're solving for the speed, that gives you square root of r times g. So that square root of 4,000 uh, meters times 9.8 meters per second squared. And so what that ends up giving you is a uh, total speed
of approximately uh, uh, 197.9 meters per second, which to two significant figures means that you're essentially going about 200 meters per second. So you have to go pretty dang fast on these O'Neill cylinders in order to actually produce the gravitational simulation. In other, in other words, in order to simulate the Earth normal gravity. For what it's worth, this basically means that you're making approximately one complete revolution every uh, just over two minutes. And the problem with that, of course, is that if you're trying to design your O'Neill cylinder, as shown in this conceptual picture, is that even with a very large O'Neill cylinder, and if you make it smaller, then you actually end up with a slower speed, but a faster um, rate of revolution. For example, if you decide to make this O'Neill cylinder only five kilometers across as opposed to five miles across, you'd find that your speed was 160 meters per second, but that you'd be making one complete revolution every 100 seconds. Um, in any case, the design flaw of sorts can be seen in this picture. You have the sun here, and that sun is essentially what's providing day and night within this O'Neill cylinder. So each time you make one whole revolution, you've gone through one cycle of day and night. But you're making one revolution every two minutes instead of every 24 hours. So you'd have a two minute long day-night cycle. Uh, what this tells us basically is that if you wanted to build an O'Neill cylinder that simulates both Earth gravity and the um, basically Earth day-night cycle at 24 hours, you'd have to have a very, very large O'Neill cylinder, much greater than five miles even in diameter. So that's all that I have for today's video. And um, therefore, it's time for me to sort of roll the credits, which is all the sources that I've pulled these images from. And um, I hope that you found this video helpful. And thanks for watching.